these people didn't take the mark, they were faithful. Okay? This is referring mainly to the martyrs of Revelation 6. You remember uh, uh, John saw the souls under the altar of them that were beheaded, you know? And so these, these martyrs are being honored, and the other ones in the crib too. These martyred saints will enjoy their resurrection along with others to receive, V-I-N, vindication on those who shed their blood. Now, when they were killed, a lot of people said, well, where's God? He saw every bit of it. And now they're being rewarded for their faithfulness. Right? Now, notice... Yeah, a vindication on those who shed their blood. Although there will be many who are resurrected in the first resurrection, these martyred believers receive special mention and special honor. I think of what's going on today uh, over there in the Middle East. And uh, they, uh, the last one, they lined up 12 uh, uh, ladies, I think. And uh, after they had raped them and done all these things, they said, renounce Christ and live and turn to Islam and live or you die. And they just started praising God and had their heads chopped off. And I don't even know if they're Christians. Only God knows that, you know. Because I know they call Roman Catholics Christians a lot of times when we know that it's system, if they follow that, it's a works-related system and not a grace-related system, and that creates a problem. There are some saved, we know that, but the majority, if they follow their system, then they're in trouble, right? It's faith in Christ alone, okay? Now, and like I said, I had sisters who were Catholics and brother-in-law, so I understand where I'm coming from. Number three. Oh, and by the way, this resurrection, not only will they be resurrected during the 75 days, but will all the saints of history who have believed, they will be part of this first resurrection. Okay? Three. And they lived and reigned with Christ, how long? A thousand years. The point is they lived again. They physically came to life again. Their soul and spirit in heaven returns to be reunited with their bodies on earth again. Now, you remember that when Christ went on high, I believe he personally, sometime around there, he took those spirits that were in the heart of the earth in the paradise department and took it up to heaven. And Paul said he was called up to the third heaven in the paradise. So there, and then Isaiah talked about hell being enlarged. So I believe their soul and spirits were already taken up. And the fact that Revelation 6, 9 through 11 shows that they're not part of the body of Christ, but their spirit and souls are in heaven. So their bodies, though, have died. So they raised their bodies up. And they're reunited with their spirit. B, here we have the fulfillment that Christ promised. Where it's underlined. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. John is the first one to tell us the duration. The duration, 1,000 years, of this golden age, the kingdom. This means it is a literal kingdom. And John mentions its length no less than six times in Revelation, a thousand years. A lot of people try to do away with that. But John, it's a literal thousand years that will be taking place for the kingdom to happen. Notice then... When mentioning the 12 apostles on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, understand that on earth, Jerusalem will be the throne 
and all nations will come to it. It states there, during this thousand-year reign here, at that time they shall call Jerusalem, what? The throne of the Lord, and all nations shall be gathered unto it. You'll see why in just a second. I need a calculator. Somebody got a calculator tonight? Well, okay, well, we'll need one here in just a minute. I need you guys to figure something out for me here. Notice E, Christ's long-awaited kingdom reign in Israel, Jerusalem, has arrived. Just notice uh, Luke there where it's underlined. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. You can read Isaiah sometime. Look at Zechariah. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Isaiah 24, where it's underlined. When the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. And Isaiah 9, 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David, upon his throne, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even, what? Forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And so, I've said before, I don't know if you ever remember or not, this thousand years here is actually a transition to eternity. And it will be the last transition going into eternity. And we'll, we'll see that as we go through this a little bit. But lost mankind, now, this is called, I think it's important to remember, uh, this is called the first resurrection. That is really important to remember that. We've just been dealing with believers, believers of the ages and so on. Okay? Now, but lost mankind, verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection that we just discussed. But the lost people, when these folks are raised up, the lost people remain in hell, in Hades, in torment, through the entire thousand years before they're raised. Okay? Number one, this refers to all lost mankind throughout earth's existence who have no part in the blessed first resurrection, non-believers, they're unsaved. The lost of the ages, their soul and spirit, will remain in Hades, in the heart of the earth, in torment until the end of the thousand years when they will be raised to be judged at the white throne judgment. So the lost are raised up at the end at the end of the thousand years. The saved are raised before the thousand years, the lost are raised after the thousand years. Okay? This also shows there are two resurrections separated by a thousand years. That's just what I said. First resurrection, thousand years, the second resurrection. The first resurrection is of all the saved of the Old Testament, four Gospels, and early Acts, and the seven-year tribulation. Remember, our resurrection, transformation, the body of Christ, us, has already, has already happened at the rapture. And it was secret. Every eye didn't see him. We went up and met him in the air, went away with him, didn't we? Ours is not part 
of the first is not a part of the prophetic first resurrection. Ours is completely different than theirs. Okay? Normally, the first and second resurrections, and I've heard this many times, are mentioned together in prophecy without reference to the period of time that separates these two great resurrections. You have the first, it's separated by a thousand years, then you have the second. Kenny, go call Culver's, order me four pieces of chicken. My stomach's growling right now, okay? Just on, be on the ready, on guard. We go down there and eat after. We, we don't eat until afterward. Sounds very good, doesn't it? But now notice John there where it's underlined. For the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. Everybody in the grave. And shall come forth. Now get this. They that have done good unto resurrection of life. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. You see? They have them together. There's no separation there. Do you see that? But remember that shouldn't bother you. Because if you remember, in Isaiah 9, 6, we showed last week, unto us, a son is, uh, uh, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That's happened, and the government shall be up on his shoulder. That doesn't happen until here. So it's already been a 2,000-year gap right there. Okay? Notice Daniel, just where it's underlined. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. You see, they're both at the same time there. But remember, in reality, there's a thousand-year difference between those two resurrections right there. Okay? How many of you get that? Get that? Okay? Now, notice Israel's priesthood. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death, or second resurrection, hath no power. But they shall be priests of God, those of the first resurrection, and of Christ, and shall reign with him, how long? A thousand years. Now notice A. The first resurrection is promised that the second death will have no power, no ability to touch a first resurrection believer. Amen? In other words, if you're raised up here, you have eternal life, you get to go in for a thousand years, this resurrection can't touch you at all because you have eternal life. That's for them. Amen? So he's saying the second death, the second resurrection, which is unto death, can't touch those who participate in the first resurrection. Okay? Notice and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The second resurrection, the second death. You could say the same thing. And all those people raised there, they go to hell. So that doesn't touch the person who was resurrected the first time. Uh, notice Revelation 2.11 where it's unlined, He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the... See, the one who overcome gets to go into the kingdom. John 11, the same thing. Now, B, the mainly Jewish believers in the prophetic program, when resurrected unto life, will go into the kingdom with eternal life. They don't ever have to worry about it from that point on. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ. Israel, being a nation of priests, has long been a hope for the people. How many times have I told you that Israel will be a kingdom of priests? Right here it is. That's what they looked for, longed for, hoped for. Understand, Israel never could have that intimate relationship with God on their own but always had to go through a priest to God for them. 
That's why they had the sacrificial system set up. They had the priest that would offer all the sacrifices. Then they had the high priest who would go into the Holy of Holies for the whole nation. The individual believer never got to go through those things, did they? Okay? But one day in the kingdom, they won't need another priest to do it because their priest, they can do it. <laughs> Amen? But in the kingdom, that is over. In the kingdom, the individual Israeli will be able to go directly to God since they will be priests themselves. Now here's a question. Why did John the Baptist come washing, baptizing with water and the twelve waiting for the Holy Spirit or oil that represents the Holy Spirit at Pentecost? Now remember, here's what these verses, where it's underlined. Exodus shall be a peculiar Israel, a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And it's the children of Israel. You see that? That's going to happen right here. In the thousand year kingdom, Israel will be a kingdom of priests, ministers for God. Exodus, where it's underlined, to hollow them, Aaron and his sons, to be priests, the first ones, to minister unto me in the priest office. Aaron and his sons, thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle, and shall, what? Wash them with water, that's a purifying ceremony, a baptismal, right there. And let me just say also that I don't believe the Bible teaches us immersion, even when it was taking place. We've created that in tradition. I believe they, that it was impossible for them to immerse people by the numbers, when they all came out from Judah and Jerusalem and so on to be baptized, they figured up how many things they would take. And all. I believe they used a hyssop branch. They dip in the water, and as they walk by, whack, 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 dip in the water, whack, whack. That's what David said with hyssop. Interesting. That's a wet, or I'm not sure. And then notice what it says. Take the anointing oil and pour it up on his head and anoint him. They were preparing to be a national priesthood in the kingdom, as the kingdom would soon be offered. Isaiah says to Israel, But ye shall be named the priest of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Peter says, And holy priesthood. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a ho and holy nation, Israel, a peculiar people, because you've been chosen by God. Revelation hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, and hath made us unto our God kings and priests, we shall reign with him on earth. And then here in Revelation 26. So here Israel will fulfill them becoming the kingdom of priests. Back here was preparation. Even before, preparation so that they could go and be a kingdom of priests. Amen? Now, do, not find, do you not find it odd and amazing that Paul in 13 epistles never mentions us as being priests? Isn't that interesting? Why would that be? Huh? We're not associated with the prophetic program, right? And we're not associated with the sacrificial system. And Israel was. Very, very interesting. Three, and shall reign with him a thousand years. God's word is absolutely, absolutely true, and every promise he has made to the people of Israel will be fulfilled. Even notice this, where it's underlined, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And how many times people pray that prayer, 
when in reality it's a Jewish prayer. Praying for their kingdom. Huh? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and so on. You know, the same context says, if you forgive people, I'll forgive you. But if you don't forgive them, I won't forgive you. Do you want that a part of your life? Of course not. But we, uh, Paul said it, and I think most of us, we did it ignorantly. We just didn't know better. Okay? But it's a prayer for the kingdom to be on earth. And then Zechariah and so on. B, notice the covenants he fulfills through the kingdoms being set up. You, you remember for us, uh, it says as Gentiles, I preached it Sunday, we had no covenant. We had none of those promises. Israel did. And when this is fulfilled here, it fulfills other covenants that were promised to us. Okay? For instance, his promise to Abraham. You can read that sometime. This here fulfills, too, his promise of the Palestinian covenant. That's about the land and going there and so on. Three, it fulfills his promise to David. Notice just verse 16 there, 2 Samuel. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established for how long? Forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. That's the promise to the throne. And you know, in Matthew chapter 1, by the way, it mentions Abraham, the son of Abraham, the son of David. Son of Abraham, the promise for the land. The son of David, the promise to the throne. All these are fulfilled here in this kingdom reign. Okay? And then number four, his promise to Israel of the new covenant. Jeremiah, just where it's underlined, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. And then where it's underlined, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. And then Romans eleven twenty seven. 27, for this is my covenant unto them, Israel, the Jews, when I shall take away their sins. You see, Israel here, Christ, when he returns, the new covenant is enacted to go into the kingdom. This is when their sins are forgiven here, right in this range here. Not back here. Their sins are taken away here. That's what Acts 3, 19 says. Uh, pull up, Dave. Pull up Acts 3.19 and 20, I think. But Acts 3.19 for sure, I think that's it. And our sins are forgiven, taken away when? The moment we believe. But with Israel, their sins are taken away. Repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come. When is that? From the presence of the Lord. When is his presence? The presence of the Lord is when he returns here. Okay? Get that? Okay. Four. Remember, the kingdom will be like no other time in human history. Notice just a few things of what the kingdom will be like. Now, I put some of these things down. Now, this might be boring to us because it doesn't affect us. But remember, all the prophecies about this, how important this is. Because when you understand this, you can understand the body of Christ. That we are unique. We are special. God is doing something today that's unbelievable. Amen? Now, notice... A, after the tribulation, God will immediately renovate, renovate the earth and heavens because of having been, been devastated by the three series of judgment. He says, For behold, I create a new heavens and new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. He's going to make it such that people just forget the old earth They'll remember the tribulation and all the debris and stuff like that. 
And then they're going to see the new renovation of God, what he does on this earth. Huh? It's going to be good. And notice what I say here. This is not Revelation 21, 22. But it takes place as these believers go into the kingdom. God will re-resurface the face of the earth for all to enjoy. Yeah, that, uh, it, this renovation takes place right here probably. In the 75 days and they go into kingdom. You remember all the judgments that come in the seven-year tribulation? The meteorites and the, you know, the earthquakes. <laughs> I mean, islands flee, flee away. It's, it's going to be disastrous. Well, God's going to fix all that. Note that the heavens and earth in Revelation 21 22 are not a renovation, but a brand new order of creation. In other words, after the white throne judgment, by the way, when we come to the white throne judgment, the heavens and the earth have fled away. They're gone. And somewhere in space, I don't know where, the white throne takes place. And the souls of those lost will be judged there and cast into the lake of fire. And then God creates a new heaven and a new earth that we will dwell on. The kingdom will switch from this earth to the new earth. This is a transition into eternity. Okay? Some things will remain, like the Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea, but many things will be new. The earth's highest mountain will be in the center of Israel. <laughs> That's amazing. Evidently, the world's topography is changed back into pre-flood condition. Even the earth's axis is set right as before the flood. You remember, I believe it was like this, and then he did this and created the polar caps and froze and things. You remember? But before that took place, and just briefly after it, because of the sin gene, you know, people lived a lot longer. When it goes back right, conditions will be wonderful once again, and people will have long life. Zechariah, where it's underlined, that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, and half of them toward the hinder sea. One would be toward the Mediterranean, and the other one toward the Dead Sea. And notice the last part of Ezekiel 47, the last phrase there, the water shall be healed. The Dead Sea, it, it produces what now? Yeah, salt, but nothing. Nothing can live in it, right? But those waters are going to be healed, and they're going to be pure, and they're going to be clean. Even water is going to come from the very throne of God into these rivers, Mediterranean and the Dead Sea, and heal them. Huh? B, there will be a new peace throughout the world. Notice, you can look at those verses right below the two verses. With Christ, the Prince of Peace, present, there will finally be true peace worldwide because he reigns there will be problems but Christ's rule prevents wars why will there be problems because people are born during the thousand years and when they're born they're born sinners they have to make a decision see there will be a new godliness. Remember those entering the kingdom will be a righteous people being believers. All the lost will have been taken away and Israel's new covenant activated. A new level of moral purity will pervade the earth. 
Won't that be good for them when they go in, when it really first begins? Only believers with Christ here. What a wonderful time that will be. Huh? D, there will be a new one world religion that is God's alone. No other religion will be permitted but only the true gods. I like, I like uh, he said, all the world, and that, all flesh shall uh, come to worship before me, nobody else, me, Zephaniah, for then I will turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. We'll have one language on the face of the earth at that time. I personally believe it will be Hebrew. I believe that's what it will be. E, all will learn, more. I'm glad it's going to be Hebrew, uh, because if I were around here somewhere, I didn't do very good with English, so I'd like to try a different language. <laughs> Amen? All will learn more about God, including coming children. Notice where it's underlined. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the earth, and all the children shall be taught of the Lord. Won't have a secular public school system, will it? <laughs> Amen. There will be a new government, godly. Notice verse 9. They that dwell in the world shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. <laughs> Zechariah once again. In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. G, there will be a new relationship, new harmony between man and beast. I love this. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. And so on, verse 17, and the cow and the bear shall feed. Verse 8, and the sucking child shall play on the hoe of the asp. And verse 9, they shall not hurt nor destroy. I hope one day in heaven God gives me a bingo tiger. Amen. Are they beautiful or what? Wouldn't you like to cuddle up with one? Yeah. <laughs> we'll pull his teeth first. Now, there will be health with a longer lifespan. That's an understatement. Death will only be for unbelievers. Total health will be the norm in the kingdom with sickness and deformity being removed. In that day shall the deaf hear, the eyes of the blind shall see. Isaiah 33, 24, and the inhabitant shall not say, I am sick. That be good? Never get sick. One, there will be no longer, there will no longer be any infant deaths, or believers for that matter, in the kingdom. The specific age one may die is 100 years old. Because of man's lifespan, this will be considered as having died young. You died 100, you could have lived for 1,000. It is possible that the age of, account of accountability for those born that are sinners is 100 since unbelievers are cursed at the age of 100. Now notice the verse here, for the child shall die an 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be cursed. So somebody born, even though they're a sinner, They'll have a hundred years to make a decision whether they have faith or not. Death will not be from natural causes, but it will be the result of the judgment of God. This shows that death in the kingdom is only for the unbelievers. Nowhere 
in the Bible does it speak of a resurrection of millennial believers. The reason is they never die. They won't need to be resurrected. I, there will be a new temple for worship and sacrifices as a memorial for the cross, the cross is sacrifice of Christ. Notice where it's underlined, that the mountain, the kingdom of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, that's in Jerusalem, and all nations shall flow into it. Come ye and let us go to the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. Last page. Everybody said? You're happy, happy, happy. Notice Isaiah 56, 7. Even then will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. So there will be sacrifices during the kingdom. Isn't that interesting? For a memorial. To remember the cross. Yeah. I don't believe we will. That's just me. I believe we'll be in heaven. The body of Christ is heavenly. Israel is earthly. Now, that doesn't mean we won't visit the earth. We might have positions over some of the areas of the earth. But our, our place is heaven. Remember? Right, yeah. That's why we have the glorified bodies, to be able to be in heaven. They will be on earth. They will be reproductive and everything, just normal. I don't believe so. Mm -mm. Now, after the end of a thousand years, that's a different story. Okay? Now, I need your calculators, people. I need help. How many feet are in a mile? 2,000 what? Five what? <laughs> 5,280. Okay, 5,280. Now, get this now. Ezekiel 40, 48 shows that this new kingdom temple, you think about they gave a lot of fanfare to the Norman, or Norm, the Mormon temple up North Carmel and all the, I think Tim Mayer even worked on that. But they had an open house. Everybody just talk about, talk about. And you see that building there, okay? Now, notice this. The kingdom temple will be a 50, 50 miles square. So figure out how many feet that is. No, no, it has to be a lot more than that. 50 miles. Each, each mile, 5,280, did you say? 580? will be a 50-mile square surpassing any temple previously. Can you imagine that? A 50-square-mile temple. That's just right before you get to Columbus, to Indianapolis. That's one way, same way, same way, same way. All the square foot in the middle. It's unbelievable, this massive size of this thing. And I was wondering how in the world are... You know, and I'm sorry that I, I took people's mansions away a long time ago in John 14 for the people. I go to prepare a place for you where I be, you're going to be. He's talking to his 12, okay, and they're going to have places there to live there. They're going to have thrones. So how in the world could they do that until you see, my goodness, this temple here is massive, 50 miles square. Heaven is what, 144,000 square miles or something like that? Is that what it is? I don't know how. Anyway, heavenly Jerusalem I'm talking about. Okay. But anyway, did anybody figure that out yet? It'd have to be millions of feet. No. Yeah, so 
So how much is that? Over a million. Four times. Feet. What? One million fifty feet. It's massive. Okay, no, no. This temple will be the center of worship to Jesus Christ. And by the way, now you can understand how you could have lots of people from the nations come representing their nations to worship him. This place is going to be massive. It will show God's purpose that he has chosen Israel to be a kingdom of priests, his ministers to all other nations. Amen. Now, conclusion. Finally, the promised Jewish kingdom on earth, the prophetic program fulfilled with Christ reigning, will be fulfilled. Deuteronomy, just where it's underlined, he says about Israel, in the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers to give them, now get this, as the days of heaven upon the earth. That's a great little phrase right there. It will be, let it, the earth be as your will in heaven, heaven on earth, during this thousand year kingdom reign here. Christ is here. How in the world could you not believe him? He's sitting right there. Isn't that something? But just follow me. Uh, Thy kingdom come. There's your prayer. Acts 1, this is after the resurrection, at the end of the 40 days that Christ was on the earth before he ascended, after his resurrection. And now notice, when they, therefore, the 12 apostles, or others, were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. See, that's what they've always wanted. Well, one day they're going to get it. Now notice, yet amazingly, in the kingdom, a vast, a vast number, even after living in this envir environment with Christ, with him present, will want nothing to do with God. These are many of those born during the thousand years. They will not only be ungrateful, unbelieving, but also wickedly rebellious against God. They will be the final ones who will follow Satan and his army. Remember this now. Notice Revelation. And when the thousand years are expired, fulfilled, Satan shall be loosed. So here we go. Right here at the end. At the end of the thousand year reign, Satan is loosed out of the abyss and he comes to the earth. Now notice, this is amazing to me. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, they're reformed, to gather them together to battle. Now get this, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Now think that through. That's unbelievable. Somebody says, well, we'll look at this. Notice what the question why and how could this happen next week? <laughs> Amen. We'll have Satan coming back on the scene next week. <laughs> hey, as somebody once said to an elderly lady, somebody, somebody said to an elderly lady, you're always thinking the best of people and thinking positive things. You'd even, if you had a chance, you probably would even praise the devil. And she said, well, you have to give him credit. He sticks at what he does. Huh? Amen. He doesn't give up. Now, thinking you're down here for a thousand years and you're out, it seemed like he'd be on his face asking God for forgiveness. Amen. 
It's unbelievable. But the tragic thing is, will be the millions of people, because a thousand years you can produce a civilization that's unbelievable, right? And ladies will bear even longer because they, you know, they'll be healthy. You know, how old was, we think of uh, Sarah, I don't think that'll be anything in the kingdom. So they're going to mass produce. They would have made good Catholics, mass producing. <laughs> Amen. But as the sands of the sea, that's hard to comprehend, isn't it? Yes. I don't know. I can't remember. Hey, that was last week. Anybody remember? Well, we gave several things that's going to take place during that time. There's going to be the judgment of the living nations. 